Deb Carroll's that uh, when you get to hear about the different types of situations and circumstances that people are going through in life. Amen. And so there was certainly when we started putting these testimonies together, we didn't want to just, you know, uh, put all the ones that are victorious and just sounds like they win every battle. But we wanted you to see that people are going through difficulties, tough times, difficult situations. They come to this church. God does a mighty thing for them because they begin to trust him to be faithful in their lives. Amen. And so we just want you to hear those types of things. The thing that we heard David, his testimony last week, and uh, uh, the medical issue that he had, and the list goes on and on and on. And as we continue to go forward this year uh, in just repeating by giving testimonies, God wants to repeat the miracles that we talk about. Amen. He wants to repeat these miracles. So connect your faith today. If you happen to be that person that's, that was like Deb was in, one, in, in a specific time in her life where she didn't have enough and she was in need. And yet God stepped up utilizing other people to come in and answer our prayers, answer those things that we released our faith for him to do in different people's lives. Amen. Amen. Would, you, would you give Deb Carroll a big hand clap, please? <laughs> Actually, all those who have testified this year. They've just been outstanding. Before I get into today's session, I want to remind you about Kenneth Copeland. He's coming Friday, September 17th. Amen. Yeah. Uh, he is a mind and Missy spiritual father. And, uh, you know, I remember just as a teenager uh, listening to Brother Copeland on Real to Real Tape, Real to Real. And uh, then finally it became eight tracks, and then finally it became cassettes. And he was, at one time, he was my favorite singer. And, uh, and so I just grew up listening to him. And then when I was 21 years old, I went to work for him. I worked for him until I was 39 years old before we started this ministry. And so that's, uh, that's just a little bit, little bit of a snapshot of the kind of impression and impact this gentleman has had on my life. And he's truly anointed. And come and, and take advantage of the anointing that is upon him. I guarantee you he'll impart it to you Amen. on September 17th. Amen. Lord, we just honor you today. We give you thanks and praise. Thank you for the opportunity to stand up here and be a shepherd, not a hireling. To be someone who cares for the sheep, whose heart is for the sheep. Thank you for placing that assignment on the inside of me. I can't imagine doing anything else. I just want to honor you today and tell you how much I appreciate you touching the lives of these people. Thank you, Father, that I know it's you and it's your power, not me. And I just ask the Holy Spirit now to do what you do best. And like Paul said, my speech and my preaching is not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but my speech and my preaching is in the demonstration and the power of the Holy Ghost. That people's faith would no longer stand in the information facts and the wisdoms of men. But their faith would stand in the power of God. We honor you for that today. That your tangible, tangible presence come upon your people. And that you demonstrate your power in their lives. Starting today and from this day forward. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I don't know if you've noticed this or not. You probably have. But here at Pathpoint, we don't point out your flaws, your mistakes, your failures, what you could do better. No, our focus is on what's possible. Because this is the language of prophecy. You see, our focus is on a life you haven't lived yet, a position you've yet to occupy, a dream you haven't experienced yet, a throne you haven't set in, a crown you haven't, a crown to wear. Titles to carry. And this is what this series is all about. We've shown you that if at least five scriptures where it says Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Today I want you to say this after me. I am a king in alliance with King Jesus. Now if you believe that, give a shout to your king. Amen. <clears throat> 
Hallelujah. Now, thousands of years ago, a great prophet by the name of Isaiah, he wrote this, he said this, and it, here it's recorded in his book. It says, a child has been born for us, a son has been given to us. Now, notice this is how prophecy speaks. Notice how he's speaking of Jesus long before Jesus ever came to this planet. He's speaking of him in the future as if it already lay in the past. This is what prophecy says and does. This is why in the book of Romans, uh, Paul said, We call things that be not as though they were, as if they've already happened. Amen? Again, uh, in the Word of Faith movement, we called that confession. And it is confession. Until what you're saying or what you're reading out of Scripture drops down on the inside of your spirit. And one day it becomes a declaration and you speak it out. And when that happens, it then becomes prophecy. You're literally prophesying your future. Amen. Every syllable, every consonant, every vowel in a prophetic word is intertwined with faith and cannot be separated from faith itself. When it leaves the mouth, it, it, it leaves with the force of faith on it to bring it to pass. Amen. Amen. This is how God created the heavens and the earth. And this is how his sons and daughters do the same thing. We create our world by prophesying it out, speaking it out of our mouth, intertwined with faith. Amen? And so, this is why in the 13th chapter of Revelations, it says this, that the Lamb of God was slain before the foundations of the world. One translation says that he was slain before the world ever began. How is that possible? How could Jesus have died on the cross before the world ever started? What is he doing? He's speaking a prophetic word. He's speaking into the future as if it lay in the past. This is how faith speaks. This is what prophecy sounds like. You need to know that prophecy is a strategy of Jesus, of King Jesus. And he wants the body of Christ. He wants the church. He wants his kings, his, his kings and his lords to prophesy and speak their lives into existence. Amen. Amen. Now notice what this great prophet went on to say. The responsibility of complete dominion will rest on on King Jesus' shoulders, and his name will be the Wonderful One, the Extraordinary Strategist, the Mighty God, the Father of Eternity, the Prince of Peace. So he gave him five titles right there. Five is the number for grace. Great and vast is his dominion. He'll bring immeasurable peace and prosperity. He'll rule on David's throne and over David's kingdom to establish and uphold it by promoting justice and righteousness from this time forward and forevermore. The marvelous passion that the Lord Yahweh, commander of the angels, armies has for his people will ensure that it is finished. His passion that he has for you will ensure that this assignment is finished. Amen. Say, it is finished. It is. Amen. So King Jesus is the extraordinary strategist. That tells us that there's not one strategy that's ordinary. Take tithing. There's a strategy. What's ordinary about that? Take, lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. What's ordinary about that? Take the 10th chapter of Acts, verse 8, where he says, heal the sick. It wasn't a request. It was a command. Heal the sick. He said, raise the dead. It wasn't a request. He said, do it. Amen? Amen. He said that we are to look to the Father to meet all of our needs, not according to our needs, but according to His riches in glory by and through Christ Jesus. Does any of that sound ordinary to you? No, it's an extraordinary. These are, each one of these are extraordinary strategies. Amen? And so King Jesus is an extraordinary strategist, and you have to see Him like that. Because without it, you will not live with a strategy. Therefore, you will not live with intention. And you will not live on purpose this life that he has called you to. 
He has called you to stay out in front of your problems, not have to react to your problems. He's called you as a, as a king and a lord to stay out in front of sickness and disease, poverty, lack, Amen. scarcity. The list goes on and on. Any, any force of darkness, any result that has been... Uh, any result that has been produced by the forces of darkness and the world of dark spirits, any of those results, he has already told us and given us a strategy in the future to where those things don't happen in our lives. Amen? Amen? Give the great strategist a big hand clap. So this tells you that his strategy is not for us to be inactive. Right? His strategy is not for us to be flippant or casual about uh, this, any assignment that he gives us, whether it be anything that's in this word. Take, the, take this book. It is a book of prophecy, a prophetic book. But in it, there, there are assignments, just like as we go to read the many stories of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, the list goes on and on. What, is, what do we see that they had in common all the way throughout as a thread throughout this Bible? God always gave them an assignment. Jesus always put them on an assignment. Well, guess what? He has you on assignment. And you may not even know what it is. Amen? But he wants you to discover what it is. And it's more than one. Amen? And then he wants you to purposefully do it. I'm going to show you why that's important. So... Uh, one of his, as the extraordinary strategist, one of his strategies is to keep us in movement. Never static, never setting still. Because if we're setting still in our relationship with God, we digress instead of moving forward. He wants us in movement. Even when the children of Israel, even when the nation of Israel came out of 430 years of bondage, he takes them to the desert to get them to Canaan, the promised land. And what does he do? He doesn't let them set up a camp and just sit there. For 40 years. Every single day except on the Sabbath. They get up and they fold their tents up and they move on. And when you look at the map. And the 40 year journey they went on. They went like this. In big circles. Why? He, because he was letting us know through their lives. And through their experiences. Nah, 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 nah. Don't you sit still. You stay in motion. In your relationship with God, you stay in motion. You keep moving forward because the moment you stop, you're going to start sliding back in the old, old Pentecostals and simply God called that backsliding. <clears throat> Amen? Now, he, another thing that he, uh, this extraordinary strategist has told us is we should always be constantly in a season of growth. We're to grow up into Christ in all things. I don't know about you, but I haven't done, I haven't grown up in Christ in all things yet. Anybody here? Because I want to meet you after the service. See? So growth is a constant thing in Christ. Christ meaning, the Greek word, Christ, the anointed one and his anointing. That word anointing, Brother Copeland taught us this years ago, means to remove burdens and destroy yokes. Who could, who could stand some of that power to remove yeah. burdens and destroy yokes every day in your life? You get in my way, I'm going to take you out. Yeah. That's what happens as we move up into Christ in all things. Amen? And then finally, and these are just a few things I've sorted out. Uh, he, he expects us to continue going forward. Remember what he told us uh, prophetically coming into this year, 2021. I'm not going to quote the whole thing. I'm going to take a portion of it as I've done all year. But remember he said, This era is different as he wields his words like a sword. I look all around me only kings and lords. What lies before us are things never seen. This impossible kingdom that's beyond the explained. And we've said since January, we said many times when the Lord gives us a prophetic word, often he's speaking about the future and our spirit goes there and it arrives as our, as our understanding lags far behind. 
And it takes many, sometimes it takes months. Sometimes it takes a half a year or more for our understanding to finally catch up to that prophetic future that he's calling us into. Amen? The goal is this. The key is this. Don't wait to understand before you move into your future. Because to have understanding doesn't require faith. Amen? We're to do this by faith. So, now... I want you to think about where we've come from in this series. That, uh, in, in fact, I want us to look just how far we've come. Just as the human race has come. And what it looked like in the beginning. Let's go to the 8th chapter of Psalms. <clears throat> I wanted to read the whole thing, but let's just read this part. Yet what honor you've given to men. Created only. When, I, when we say men, just think of humanity. Created only a little lower than Elohim. Elohim is one of the names of God, crowned with glory and magnificence. So I want us to think about this. When God created humanity, he created us a little lower than himself. We are not a part of the angel class. I'm going to talk about this in our, in our series, Celestial. We're not a part of the angel class. We're not a part of the God class. We're in between. Okay. Now the angels looked at that and said, What is man that thou art mindful of him, the son of man that thou visiteth him? Why are you paying particular attention and treating him differently or treating humanity differently than you're treating us angels? This is how special you are. Amen. Not because you work for it, earned it, or deserve it, because he puts you in that class. He puts you in that position. The question is, do you recognize that you're in it? And that you're living out of that position. Are we, are we living out of a position where we let everything that's going, around us, going on around us <clears throat> affect us? And so it's woe is me. No, it isn't woe is me. Because there's no woe in me. It's giddy up. Amen. Amen. We're moving. Hallelujah. We're not only going forward, we're going upward. Amen. You are on an upward call. But look at where you started from. Just a little lower than God. Amen? Above the angel class. When he did that, then he turned around in regard to all human beings and he crowned you with glory and magnificence. You just can't see it. You are magnificent. There is glory on you already. How can you give glory to God if you don't have any? He crowned you with glory so you could give him glory. Oh, you're magnificent. Oh, you're magnificent. Hey, there you go, husbands and wives. Honey, you're just magnificent today. Amen. He crowned you with this. You already are this. And then when you came into relationship with God through Jesus Christ, look at what Jesus did. Then he crowned you as a king and as a lord. And in that moment, he did that. He gave you authority. Amen. Amen. Remember, in the kingdom of God, authority is given, never taken. Look at Lucifer. God gave Lucifer authority, but he tried to take more authority than what God had given him, and so he was thrown to the earth. He was cast out of heaven. Never try to take more authority than God gives you. Amen? Many times God will just start out giving you authority that it just is humble beginnings. It's just humble beginnings. And then in time, that authority just continues to grow and to grow because you grow up into it. Right. Amen? Now, with that authority comes responsibility. Remember what Jesus said in Luke the 12th chapter, to whom much is given, much is required. So if you've been given much, there's much required of you. If all, you have, if all you've been given is a little, then all he'll require of you is a little. But if he's given you a lot, then he's requiring a lot of you. Right. A lot from you. It's required. 
I remember the day I settled that on the inside of me. I came out of poverty. I know what that looks like. And I know where I've come from and where I've come to. And this is just one easy example for us all that we can all relate to on some level. See, when you're sleeping on a concrete floor and you don't know if you're going to have any food. Many times I was sent to school back then. They didn't have pantries. They didn't have, you know, reach out to whoever to get you to have meal and things like that. No, you either had something or you didn't have something. Amen. It was just that black and white. That's the truth. But where I came from to where I am, see, he's given us much. Many of you have much. Well, guess what? Much is required of you. From who? Not the government. That's not who he's referring to here. He's referring to himself. King Jesus requires, the kingdom of God requires much of you. Amen? Now, with this authority, it's accompanied by superpowers. That's right. I want you to let that sink in. Now, we know this because it's in humanity already. It was placed in there when you were born that you have a desire, even if you're not a Christian, you have a desire for powers that are beyond normal powers. This is where Superman came from, Spider-Man. That didn't just come out of the air. That came out of a, a deep desire on the inside. You know why? Because the Bible says when you became a, 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 a Christian, you became a new creature in Christ. Amen. In other words, the world hadn't seen anything like you before. Amen. And you were pretty special before. With Him crowning you with glory mm-hmm. and magnificence, then making you a king and a lord. And yet, now he did something different. He said, I want to create a class of your own. You're a new creature. In other words, he put it in such a way where it cannot be defined or described or explained. But he said, "One uh, uh, one of the characteristics of this new creature is all their old is passed away and all things have become new. Oh, what the Lord has already showed me and prophetically given me a word for 2022. You're going to like it. Amen. Are you getting anything out of this yet? Hallelujah. I'm just speaking out of my heart this morning. He's given you authority, and then that authority is accompanied by superpowers. You've got to see yourself having those powers. Amen. I'll let you go into the last 20 years of teaching here. I'll let you go through Scripture where we've shown you power, 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 power that you have. You already possess it. Amen. Go back into uh, the examples of other people's lives. In fact, we'll look at one here in a minute. And just go back and look at how that superpower manifested in their life. And how it not only affected them, it affected others. Amen. Now, uh, when you're, so with all this in mind, when you're on assignment, you've been given an assignment from King Jesus. And the enemy comes up to confront you and stop your progress. Here's what will happen. He will be met with God's ability and not your own. Amen. This is one of the reasons, it's one of the benefits. I found this to be true. This is one of the benefits of being on an assignment that King Jesus handed you. He said, I want you to do this. I know now that when the enemy comes to stop me, then he'll be met with God's ability, not mine. I'm going to show it. I'm going to show you. This is going to resonate throughout this session today. Now, there are other benefits to this. The safest place you will ever be on this earth is in an assignment that King Jesus gives you. 
It's the safest place you'll ever be. This is why I don't, when, G, when he tells me, when he gives me an assignment, I don't run from it. I run into it because I know, oh, I'm going to be safe in that place. I'm going to be safe in that place. Now, let's just take a couple of examples. Think of the disciples who were on an assignment. Jesus said, they just got through ministering, and Jesus said, now you guys get in a boat, you go on the other side of the lake. He said, I'm going to go up there in the mountain to pray. They got about halfway across that lake, and all of a sudden, here came a storm. But who came with that storm? Jesus, walking on water. And he spoke to that storm, and he calmed that storm. That didn't just happen once in the four Gospels. It happened many times. Various uh, different versions of it, but still. Amen? And so, the safest place you can be is in an assignment that King Jesus gives you. Amen? Remember the, the day that Peter was on assignment, Jesus said, Now go down here <clears throat> and fish. First fish you catch, pick it up, open his mouth, there will be a coin in it. Take that coin and go pay our taxes. When you're on an assignment with Jesus, he'll pay your taxes. I said, he'll make sure your taxes are paid. Now, you know why Jesus had to tell Peter the first fish you catch? Because he knew Peter's a fisherman. He's going to sit there and fish. No, the coin's in the first one's mouth. Amen. Now, what about the disciples who were on assignment with King Jesus, co-laboring with him. Jesus has been preaching all day, and you thought I preached a long time. He's been preaching all day. And so he decided before he sent everybody home hungry, he was going to feed them. This was to 5,000 people on one event, another 4,000 people. Completely different event. And so he took the bread and the fish, and he broke it. He broke those food items and then he handed them to the disciples and as they distributed out multiplication was in the disciples hands they were co-laboring together amen the the disciples never went hungry the disciples the disciples never went without amen because they were always on assignment when G, when they, because they were on assignment with Jesus, he would perform many signs, wonders, miracles, and healings. And there came a day he said to them, Now, greater works than these shall you do, because I'm going to go to my Father, which is in heaven. And from that day forward on assignment, there they went. And they went, and they performed many signs, wonders, miracles, and healings. In fact, the Bible says, <clears throat> Scripture tells us in the New Testament that at least eight Scriptures where it tells us this was the validation. Signs, wonders, miracles, and healings were the validation of an authentic God-called ministry. If it's a real ministry called by God, there'll be signs, wonders, and miracles in it. That's what authenticates it. Not how good someone preaches. Not how much Bible they know. No. No. But whether they'll step aside and let the Holy Spirit perform. Amen. Now, the Bible says he'll watch over his word to perform it. Amen. He'll hasten his word to perform. He'll come confirming his word with signs following. All these things are validations of a true God-called ministry. Amen. Now, so... We see two places here, two benefits. The first benefit is when I'm on an assignment that has been given to me by King Jesus, then if the devil comes to stop me, he will be met with God's ability, not my own. The second benefit is when I'm on an assignment that King Jesus gives me, it's the safest place I could ever be on this earth. He will take care of me, he will protect me, and he will keep me. Give the Lord praise in this house. Now, let's take take a look at this, see if it's true. Let's take a scriptural look at this. We could look at many different examples of different people in their lives. 
But let's look at David. Remember the book of Acts? The Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. The reason David was a man after God's own heart is because as a boy, David was after God's heart. He didn't wait to become a man to get after God. He got after God as a boy. And he'd be out there tending his father's sheep. And uh, a bear would come up try to kill one of those sheep or take one of those sheep and eat a lion would come up and here the power of God would come up on David and he'd rescue those sheep you're not gonna you're not gonna kill me they couldn't kill Daniel in the lion's den safest place you can be is when you're on assignment given to you by King Jesus amen David uh, in the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel, David is, uh, he's, he, he's not old enough to be drafted. He's, he, David is one of eight boys in Jesse's house. His seven older brothers are on the battlefield. But David hasn't been drafted because he doesn't meet the qualification. He's not old enough. So he's back home with his dad, Jesse. And one day, Jesse calls him in. says, now I've put together all of these supplies, all this food. I want you to go down to the battlefield and find your brothers and give them these, supply, the, these supplies. And uh, David said, okay, I'll do it. So he went, he went on that journey. He got to the hillside. He overlooked the battlefield, and he saw no, no movement whatsoever. There was nothing happening down there. Except he did hear Goliath. And he did hear, did hear the Philistines mocking the God of Israel. And so David made his way down into the encampment. And there he began to inquire about his brothers. And inquire and ask questions about, well, what's going on here? Because, see, the whole Israeli army were hunkered down in foxholes. As Goliath and the Philistines are cursing their God. GD this and GD that. You hear those words today, don't you? Hmm? They don't understand. They're cursing God. Amen? Now, let's look at what happens next. So now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard David when he was speaking to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against him, and he said, why have you come down? <clears throat> These are written as question marks, but they're really not. These are just quick statements that he expects no response from David. In fact, he doesn't want David to respond at all. Well, what are you, what, why are you, why are you come down here? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you've come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? Am, am I, haven't I just been talking to these people? And he, David turned away from Eliab towards these other people and began to speak with them in the same way he'd been speaking with other, these other people, inquiring, asking, what's going on? What's going on? Where's my brother's? Now, let's, let's, let's take this, okay, and break it down, all right? So here's Eliab, and he asked the question, why, why are you here? As if to say, you annoy me, you bother me, I can't stand your guts. And the next thing he says to him in question, and what, by the way, what have you been doing? What would you do with those sheep you spend so much time with? Who's taking care of those sheep now, now that you're here? In other words, you're not important. What you've done up to now, there's nothing significant about it. It's not thousands of sheep. It's just a few sheep. And you're always spending time with them. See? You're not important. You'll never be anything. I've actually had people walk up to me and say to me, these are, these, were, these are men, uh, renowned men. Not that you would know who they were if I said their name. They say, you just don't have it. You just don't have it. That's exactly what Eliab said to David. You don't, you don't have anything. There's nothing special about you. You don't have it. 
<laughs> you ever had somebody say to you, you're never going to amount to anything? Huh? What, is, uh, what are we seeing here? What was the, the last thing that was said? David said, what did I do now? This tells you that Eliab has been bullying David his whole life. And David's asking, what did I do now? What did I do now? What did I do now? Because he's a bully. Amen. Now, there's more to this story than meets the eye. Because if we, if we went back one chapter earlier in 1 Samuel 16, you will find that the, the great prophet Samuel came to Jesse's house to anoint the next king of Israel. And he did the lineup. He lined those boys up. He did a lineup from tallest, from oldest to youngest. David wasn't even invited to the pick a king party. And, 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 and yet... It was David that was anointed the next king of Israel. Amen. Eliab was there. Now you know why he got angry when he saw him. Because he's jealous of him. And it was in that moment that Eliab, right there on the battlefield, tried to pick a fight with David. Whether those be fighting words or whether we just take off the gloves. And we fight with our fist. You can bite. You can pull hair. Whatever you want to do. And get, look at what David did. He just turned and walked away. See, he knew that was not a fight he was supposed to engage in. Do you know the battles that you're not supposed to be involved in? To be engaged in. Because see, your enemy, now he was there the day that you were crowned by King Jesus. You were crowned a king and a lord. He was there and he's jealous and he's angry and he's trying to pick a fight with you. Amen. But he does it in a stealthy way. Amen. He does it by influencing people to fight for him. Are you listening? He'll, get some, he'll influence somebody to bully you, to question you, to mock you, to belittle you. What's the, what's the point here? The point is he's trying to get you engaged in a fight. And he's using that as a distraction to keep you from the real battle that lies ahead. There's a battle coming. And you're going to need all the faith necessary. And if you're over here dealing with all these little skirmishes using your energy and your strength and your focus on those skirmishes, then you're exhausted. Your faith is exhausted by the time you get to the real battle. That is his strategy to get us to fight with one another. Are you listening? To get us fight. Here's the, here's the point. Eliab is not your enemy. Even if her name is Tammy. Or his name is Bill. Or her name is Phyllis. Or his, or his name is Jim. They are not your enemy. Mm -mm. They simply have been sent because a door is open called jealousy, envy. And the Bible says where there's jealousy, envy, wherever there's strife, there's every evil thing. Amen. And so he, he's trying to pick that fight. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to repeat what I said. Because he wants to exhaust your strength. He wants to exhaust your energy so that when you get to the real battle, you won't have the faith to endure it. And the Bible says what? He that endures to the end shall be saved. And that's not just talking about going to heaven. That's talking about he that endures to the end of this 
temptation. He that endures to the end of this battle. He that endures to the end of this circumstance or situation. Amen. Are you getting anything out of this? Hallelujah. Now, this is important to take to note because I told you this years ago, don't come to Path Point Fellowship Church expecting or wanting therapy. We don't give therapy here. We will give you the Word of God. We'll build your faith up. You exercise your faith. You put it to work, and it'll work. It'll work, it'll, and it'll manifest for you. Amen. And it'll produce superpowers in your life that will get you so much further along. Hallelujah. Amen. How about the superpower of love? Yes, Amen. Love doesn't even take a wrong and say, You've wronged me. Love says, You don't owe me even an apology. But you just don't understand. I can't get over that. No. You don't understand, you won't let go of it. Let go of it. Let go of it. Eliab is not your enemy. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, here's, here's inter something interesting that happened. Every time David would go into the right battle on an assignment that was given to him by God the power of God would come upon him. And his enemy, his real enemy, would, <laughs> would be met with God's ability, not David's own ability. Every single time. With the lion, with the bear, when he charged Goliath, brought that big giant down. Now notice in that situation, if you read that closely... Goliath didn't even want to fight David. He said, why are you sending this little boy out here? Is this the champion of Israel? See, he already knows on the inside of him, the enemy, the devil on the inside of him, already knows he's going to kick my butt. He knows it. He didn't want to have anything to do with him. Now, notice the fake, the fraud, the counterfeit is wanting to pick a fight with you. But David walked away. But now David's picking a fight with the real enemy. You get so preoccupied fighting that person that is not your enemy. Then when you're facing that giant. <laughs> and that's the real battle then what will happen is they'll look at you and they'll basically say, I don't want to fight you. I don't want to deal with you. Your real battle is with the enemy, the devil. Amen? Amen. Now, let's look at something David said. This is 18th chapter of Psalms. He said, with you as my strength, speaking of God, with God as my strength... I can crush an enemy horde advancing through every stronghold that stands in front of me. Just keep that up, Alicia. King James Version says, David speaking, with you as my strength, I can run through a troop and I can leap over a wall. Amen? So every time David would go into battle... And he would go to run through a troop or go to leap over a wall. The power of God would come up on him. And he would feel the tangible power of God come up on him. He would feel it. He would feel that power. And it gave him the ability to leap that wall. It gave him the ability to run through that troop. It gave him the ability, one man, to kill 10,000. Amen? Now notice, well, I, I'm going to wait until I feel the power of God. Then I'll run. Then I'll charge Goliath. No, it's never before. It's always as. As I'm running. As I'm charging. As I'm leaping that wall. 
here comes a power of God. Amen. As I'm doing that. Now look at the two fights that David walked away from. He walked away from the fight that his older brother Eliab was picking with him. And he, took, he walked away from the fight that King Saul mm-hmm. wanted to fight him about. Mm-hmm. And yet David wouldn't even lift his sword to him. And when his friends went to lift their sword, he said, stand down. Why? Because David is not going to take that authority beyond the time in which he has been to be taking it. He's going to wait till all the authority is given in the right timing and then let the Lord do it. Let the Lord do that. Let the Lord do that. Let the Lord do this. This is about timing. Be in the right place at the right time. This is about timing. Not just time. Timing. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, your adversary is picking a fight with you by influencing other people. I'm not saying this is happening in your life now, but it's happening in some of your lives. Amen. And it will happen in your life more than once. And when that occurs, you have to know whether that is the, the right battle to enter into or not. Because bring up this last point uh, right here, Alicio. Uh, No. Because when you feel powerless, in, you, you will feel powerless in the battle you don't belong in. You will feel powerless in a battle you don't belong in. Amen. And when you don't feel the power of God come upon you as you're, as you're uh, wading into that, then you just need to go, okay, God's not in this. And you just need to step away and turn around and walk off. I can tell you this is the truth. I've, I've, this is by experience. I've had people come to me and want to offload, whatever. And if I felt powerless in it, then I knew the Spirit of God and His power wasn't upon me. So I knew that I wasn't supposed to do anything. I'm going to hear you out. But I knew I wasn't supposed to pull out the Bible, and, and, and bring up Scripture. I knew I wasn't supposed to do a lot of things. I was supposed to just sit there and, and just walk away from that situation, recognizing that's not a fight that I was ever uh, supposed to be involved in. Amen? Uh, you will find that to be true when, with your spouse. Now, back in the day, Missy and I, we could do some knockdown drag outs without hitting each other. But they might as well have been hits because those words were sharp. But you know what? We grew up out of that. We, we just grew up into Christ. And we grew out of that. And we got to the point where there's no sense threatening her there's no sense fighting with her I mean because it ruined my night it ruined my day and she knew it it ruined hers too there's just no reason for it amen so the so the best thing to do is just yeah I'm gonna I don't feel God's power in this at all so instead of engaging in that then that tells me uh, since his power's not in it, there's no sense in me going to war here. I told you by the, 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 the voice of the Holy Spirit, he told us that this year were, there would be a time that you would no longer battle things that you've been battling for years. Missy and I came into this year saying that. No, no, I'm not going to battle that. I'm not going to go to battle for that. I battled that for years. I'm not, I'm not going to war for that thing ever again. I'm going to leave it alone. Amen. I'm going to let God do whatever he wants to do. I'm going to let him minister. 
in, to my soul, which is where the stuff is lodged typically. And I'm going to do, let him do a soul cleansing on the inside of me. Amen. Listen to the, listen to the extraordinary strategist. Listen to him. Because he will show you how to preserve your strength. He will show you how to increase your faith. He will show you how to always win and never lose. He will show you how to do that. He will show you what fights are real and what is not. And what is just a counterfeit, a setup by the enemy to rob you. Because down the road there is a real battle that you're going to face. And you're going to need every ounce of faith to overcome that. Come on somebody, give the Lord praise in this house. With your strength, with you as my strength, does Psalms 18 sound familiar? Huh? I can do all things through Christ's strength who gives me strength. You should feel that strength when it comes upon you. You should feel when it's not there. How do we know that? Fourth chapter, fifth chapter of Hebrews. Paul told us having your senses exercised to discern whether the power of God is on you and whether it's not. Because that right there is telling you whether to go to battle or whether to stand down. He's telling you. It's why when people send me prayer requests, the first thing I ask the Lord is, should I pray here? Should I pray? Should I go to war? Because that's what I'm intentionally doing if you give me the green light. I can't tell many times he will say, there's no sense you going to war on that. You don't need to pray over that because it won't make one bit of difference if you do. Many times I've asked him why. And he said, it's not yours to know. You just need to know. You can spend all this time going to war on that and it won't change the outcome because the outcome has already been decided. Not by me, by who, but by that person or persons. Don't just assume, well, let's go to war. Let's go to prayer. Let's go to war. No. Should I pray over that? Amen? Amen. Do you see it? There's a lot of times when that happens to me, and I'm asked, will you pray over this? And if on the inside of me there is silence, then I know don't say anything. You're wasting your faith. You're wasting energy when you go do that. Now, what did we do today? Let me just sum it up here. What did we do today? If you came today to learn and not just listen, then you actually were trained. If you came here today and you fake listening, then have a good week. But if you learned, then you were trained. And now you can do something Amen. with what you're trained to do. Amen. This, is what's, this, is the issue, this has been the issue with the body of Christ for, for hundreds of years. Especially the body of Christ here in America. We've been taught. We've never been trained. And the Lord said to me, no, coming into 2021, he said to me, no, the days of teaching are over. It's the days of training now. Amen. We're going to show you who you are, what you actually have, and how to use it. Right. Did you learn something today? Amen. Give the Lord praise in this house. Amen. <laughs> Let's look at our next steps, if you would. I will not fight every war and will only battle when the power of God is upon me. If the power of God is not upon me, don't go to war. Because only when his power is upon me do I know that it's been validated by him. This is an authentic fight. You need to fight this battle. I told Years ago, I taught a series called, um, I don't remember what the series was called, but I, I made this statement, because this is what the series was about. 
that my life, I do not my, live my life as a marathon. I live my life as a series of sprints. Even to this day, I still do it. I enter them fast. I have a meal at night, and then I don't eat till lunch the next day. I enter them fast. I, I, even when it's eating, it's still a series of sprints for me. It's not a marathon. Amen? When it comes to when I'm running, I run as a series of sprints. I don't just go out there and jog long distances. It's too hard on your knees. It's too hard on your joints. But when you run a series of sprints, it builds muscle instead of tear it down, and it atrophy. Amen? The same is true when it comes to spiritual things. It should be a series of sprints. You want your youth to be renewed? Live life as a series of sprints. Don't burn the candle at both ends. It's not worth it. It's like Joyce Meyer told us years ago. She said you can spend all your physical health trying to make money, trying to make wealth, and then at the end of your life spend all your wealth trying to get back to your physical health. What kind of trade-off is that? It's not. No. And when it comes to spiritual things, the same is true. It's a series of sprints. How many times I heard Brother Hagin tell a story, and he would say, Now, I, I, let me just tell you, Aretha, I don't have enough faith for that right now. Sorry. I don't have enough faith. I have not, not even an ounce of faith to give to that assignment. You're going to have to believe God for that yourself. Amen. Live life as a series of sprints. Take it easy today, this afternoon. Lay down and take a nap and meditate on what God taught you today. Just listen to him. Listen to your spirit, man. Listen to what he's saying in there. Listen to him. He'll revive you. He'll recharge you. He'll replenish you. He'll relaunch you into a new type of lifestyle if you just stop. Amen. Let him do what he does best. Renew your life.